lights on or off? You guys want the lights on or off? You decide. Off? You go ahead. All right, we need to set up. This is one thing really quick. Good. Perfect, huh? <laughs> Use the roller, just um, roll it. You have a little roller, can you roll? Oh, this oh, thing. That's yeah, right. yeah, there we go. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Okay, this is just some background. It's during the 1890s when the clock spring, the robbery happened, even though, like, the people were born earlier. It was known as the progressive era, you know, the, there was strong movements towards women's rights women gained the right to vote and there was just like more rights for the workers and people people classes and stuff um now which cassidy his real name is robert leeward parker he was born in 1866 uh, he was the first of 13 children on a farm i think a cattle ranch um he was married to ann gillies from a pretty early age. I think they moved together somewhere. He had engaged in criminal activity before the Wilcox train. Like his first crime, he stole some pants and ate some pie when he broke into a clothier shop. He did get caught for that. And I think he had to do like some form of community service. Um, his nickname is a combination of two things. This Mike Cassidy, he was a, a cattle wrestler and a something, but he like mentored Cassidy a little bit, so he took his last name, and then he worked as a butcher, or an apprentice for a butcher. He did, and then he does cattle wrestling and gunslinging. Sometimes he is like his partner, you know, he's really well known among the him. His real name is Harry Longabout, or Harry Longabout, Baba <laughs> so, so. <laughs> He was born in 1870, Phoenixville. He was the best shot, best gunslinger in the Wild Bunch, as you say. And then here we have the Wild Bunch. They're a uh, a circle, a group of criminals that Cassidy like became the leader of. He kind of got them all together. They did a bunch of robberies, heists, like new things. They like to attack or steal from stagecoaches, small banks, and railroads. And they operated out of a, <clears throat> a place called the Hole in the Wall. And then as far as I read, it was like a, literally like a cave. So it was just a hole. Um, that's where they go back to. Then. Um, and now we get to the Wilcox train robbery. So it was near Wilcox in Wyoming, and I think they all planned it out. And it happened June 2nd, 1899. In the first of three well-known train robberies done by the group, as far as I got into, but it, and it wasn't even their most like expensive one, even though it, they did get a lot of money for it. Some goods. The train. It was a Union Union train. Union Pacific. Yeah, Union Pacific. So it was carrying a lot of money, and like. A couple different articles range from thirty-six to fifty thousand. In in that time, it was a lot of money. 
and they still there so there was a lot of cash from like safes that they blew open and there was also like some valuable items escape so they got away initially um and even like at first it wasn't even they didn't even know it was them but it was linked back to them and then this they were chased, began, began, began to get in chase by some detectives from the Kingston Detective Agency, which is like the best thing ever. Um, a, a posse was organized to give chase as well. Um, Cassidy and Sundance Kid, after like more crimes and stuff, they became more wanted and they were like wanted in all the states. So they uh, fled to. Argentina in South America initially, and they became they started a cattle ranch together until they committed more crimes, got wanted again, and moved to Bolivia, where they got discovered by a patrol. So the patrol like went to go <laughs> um, arrest them, but there was a shootout, and that's how they died. In my opinion. Um, it's true. Like, it happened. It made a good addition to the genre. So, yeah, that's about it. Oh, that's also, he was also a cattle wrestler, and that's his branding symbol. Mm -hmm. The movie is good, for the most part. Any questions? When you show that uh, the one cost robbery, did you show that uh, car? Do you know what happened to the safe car? They said they used too much dynamite and it blew it up. It blew the car up. Or they went, yeah, all the money flew all over. Uh, <laughs> kind of, it, the whole law is actually, it's like, a, it's like a, a narrow little valve. And you go into this, it's like, it looks like in the side of the mountain, you can't see it much right on, but it kind of winds its way into this clearing in the middle of the mountain. So that's what they call the pole. Okay. It's in Wyoming. Yeah. Good trip? Yeah. All right. Good job. Now we need a little bit of part of Giant. Oh, yes. Another great story. Be a nice change of pace from all the murder and madness. <laughs> now just a scam. Very good. Give me one sec. Okay. Oh, I gotta move the mouse. Ah, I see. Okay, so a little bit of background on uh, when this took place. This was 1869 in uh, America, and this this time period was considered the first age of showmanship in the United States. So we weren't too far off of the Civil War, and so a lot of like a lot of performance and circus and just displays of like amazing things uh, really capitalized upon during this time. So here's our first guy, George Holm. He was a tobacconist. He was uh, fascinated with the sciences, especially with uh, uh, Darwin's evolution theory. He even had uh, Darwin's book, Origin of Species, framed on his wall. So he, he loved it that much. Um, but he found himself in an argument with uh, Methodists. Uh, but being the minority party in the argument lost, um, he was ridiculed and humiliated. And so he uh, takes the rest of the year to plan his revenge. Uh, here we have William Newell. He is George Hall's cousin. And he runs a farm 
not too far out of the town of Garden. And also David Hannum is a business affiliate of Hull. So Hull hires a team, including, uh, I think it was Edward Bookard. Uh, he's a German stone cutter. Um, and they created this very statue of the petrified man. It was 10 feet tall. And it was stained with various uh, oils and acids to make it look ancient. And uh, to emphasize the ancientness, the ancient look, um, they buried the statue on uh, William Newell's farm. And then a year later, they uh, dug it up again. So yeah, it was a scam. Uh, William Newell would charge 50 cents for people to see the giant. Um, and since people from all over were coming to see it, uh, the town of Cardiff got a ton of business and patronage, like especially uh, restaurants, hotels, pubs. So, um, Paul uh, hired uh, David Hammam, his business affiliate, uh, to run a syndicate who would move the, the giant statue to Syracuse. Um, and so, uh, in the Syracuse exposition, he, uh, this man, P.T. Barnum, would take particular interest in the giant, and he offered $50,000 to buy it. Syndicate refused, so he also uh, plots revenge, and he hires someone to basically sneak into the exhibit, and they make, uh, basically make a wax copy of the part of giant and so then he claims that, uh, P.P. Barnum claims that his giant is real and that the Cardiff giant is a fake statue. And then uh, Hannum and the syndicate sue Barnum for forgery. So um, if the, court, uh, the court date for the lawsuit was set on um, February 2nd. But before any legal action can be taken, uh, Hall confessed uh, basically everything to the press and told everyone that both giants were fake. So the, the original statue uh, was displayed at the 1901 uh, Parent American Exposition, basically the World's Fair at the time, but uh, not many people took interest in it, uh, just because they knew it was there. Uh, so now the, card of the, the original statue uh, resides in the Farmers, Muse uh, Farmers Museum in Cooperstown. Uh, the wax copy that Barnum hired the other guy to make uh, is now displayed in Marvelous Marvin's Mechanical Museum. That's an excellent name <laughs> for a uh, business. And I don't know who made it, but there was a third replica that uh, resides in Fort Dodge in Iowa. I've seen that one. I know, I'm right. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Like I say, yep, it's it's an iconic image, the the petrified man. It's one of the greatest hoaxes in American history, especially for the world of archaeology. I, I found this illustration very cool. This is, a, this is a strange plot for revenge. Because <laughs> um, it, it took two years to enact. And I don't think the... 
I don't think the Methodists even really cared. So it didn't really work out. It's pretty funny. Um, and so it, it didn't seem like it was intended to be a crime at first. And I think like the, the 50 cent charge, the scam was all Newell's idea because he saw the opportunity in that to uh, make profit while Hull just wanted to fool people. And yeah, again, with uh, no charges. But that confused me. What was the big argument about between Hull and the. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, the, the big argument between Hull and the Methodists was about. Uh, what was it? Oh, yeah, Genesis 6 4. So it was basically like. There's an article or a document uh, about how like humanoid giants uh, once uh, populated the earth. So uh, like people who are like 10 feet tall or. Yeah. And, and he claimed. He wanted to disprove it. And yeah, he, he ended up making the model anyway. So, so as an atheist, he wanted to disprove uh, the article, uh, but then he wanted revenge instead by making a fool. Something that was obviously fake. Yeah. Let's go to Cooper's now. Yeah. yeah. We should see all three of the giants. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a farmers museum there because that's where the baseball hall is. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a bunch of you know, wherever there's that they put like five or six other museums and some are which is some are you know. All right, good job, y'all. Let's start the time. All right. Foundation nice Yeah, Okay. So let's do a couple more. I will do a few. So give me one sec. Let's make sure I have all this organized. <laughs> yep, go ahead. Three more crimes. I'm gonna do some interesting ones. I'll do Sun and Sam tomorrow. Pick up any loose ends. We'll do the test, and then we'll decide what to do afterwards because we have about a week. I am not going to be here that last day before. Oh, I know. Where are you going? I can't tell you a secret. Ah, CIA. You know, once again, save save the world again. It gets kind of tiring. Are you going to Germany? Hmm? Germany? Actually, though, <laughs> remember I told you this one, the guy who escaped from the Lowe's? I told you this story and he hid in a nude. He, he, he was trying to escape from after robbing a Lowe's and ran into a nudist colony. Yeah. And they caught him because he's the only guy with clothes on. Okay, so <laughs> let me get to another one. Christian Bala, 2000. And so, one second. So here's another one. This is I get a couple of humorous ones and then a few more that mean that's a humorous one. Okay. So he is a Polish author. And 
his Polish author. Well, there was a murder of Darius Genetowski. I don't know if I'm doing it with a mock Italian accent, but I'm going to do it with that. And he was murdered, unsolved murder. And he was a suspect, but had supposed to have an alibi. And this was a former associate, actually was, uh, he uh, was the husband of his ex-wife. Yeah, and a friend and, okay. But so a crime of passion said, no, I could not have done it. Well, Bala, when they wrote these books, they call them Paul Fisher. Paul Fisher might, you know, cheap paperback books. But it was a fiction writer of all these very elaborate stories and wrote a story a couple years later called Amok. Amok. And here is the uh, inside copy of it about this elaborate murder. And basically, in this elaborate murder, told the story of how he killed Daru's. Anyone want to say that with me? That's better Polish. I just want to go back into my bad Italian accent. That my nephew makes fun of. But he basically told the exact story verbatim of how we killed him and wrote a whole book. And the amazing thing was the story is about a fiction writer who murdered his wife's lover. It was about him. So basically, it really wasn't fiction. It turned out to be a bestseller, and I guess it is quite the gruesome story, but he wrote the story, and that's how he was caught for murder. And that's him in, in trial. Let's do another one, Michael Anthony Fuller. So Michael Anthony Fuller went to a Walmart in North Carolina, near Raleigh. And this is the actual, <laughs> why not put that up there? That is the Walmart. As you know, Walmarts in North Carolina are significantly different than the Walmarts in Montana or any place else. Just like McDonald's are different wherever you go. You know, it's unique. Little twists, as in they are, they're on different ground. So, he went to this Walmart, and he decided to buy a vacuum cleaner and a microwave. $476 for a vacuum cleaner and a microwave. Right? Well, you know, the... I have no idea what noise I was making there. In a way, it kind of was a steal because he paid for it with a million dollar bill. <laughs> There's no million dollar bills. Oh, no. <laughs> maybe, maybe you just don't know. Valid point. <laughs> yeah. I just like the idea. Can you break this million dollar bill? Needless to say, he was caught. I know, with that kind of ingenuity. I don't know if this is the actual picture of it, but supposedly it was with the Statue of Liberty on the million dollar bill. Now, as I understand, they have printed, like, there, there were a couple printed in the 1920s, but not, you know, this was not one of them. So he paid with a million dollar bill. So that's another one of these tribes. Let's get to a real one. One of the biggest criminal actions by an American president in history. 1791, St. Clair's defeat. So the United States was trying to conquer the Ohio Territory from the various tribes that lived there. It was a confederation of Miami and uh, Shawnee, who fierce words. The U.S. did not have a professional army. Did not have a standing army. The United States just only had militia. After the Revolutionary War, no way are we going to have any kind of standing army. That leads to tyranny. That leads to war. That leads to secret police. That leads to secret governments. Which, yeah, that's what happens. That's what happened in every country that does have a large standing army, including this one. But the United States wanted to conquer this land. So basically, they had a couple. Now, St. Clair was this uh, former Revolutionary War general. Nothing spectacular at all in the war. But they kept him basically because he had nothing else to do and he had some experience. And so he was given the command of militia and they were going to invade up into this area here, which is present day Ohio, to try to drive out this confederacy so the U.S. can conquer what is Ohio. So they marched into an ambush. And that is a picture of this ambush in the winter of 1791. A horrific defeat. Humiliating. Half of the men would be killed or wounded. They barely escaped out of it. 
This was a disaster. And perhaps the high point of American Indian resistance to to the expansion of the United States. The only one that compares maybe is Tecumseh. If they could have stayed unified, who knows how history would have been different. But Washington lied through his teeth, a massive cover-up to show what it, not only for what an absolute disaster it was. So actually, he did cut down that cherry tree. That was all made up. Yeah. Washington covered it up completely. He had very particular reasons to do this. Not only he wanted to hide the embarrassment of ordering this disastrous attack with ill-equipped militia in the middle of winter. It was insane, led by an incompetent general. But there was a House investigation. And in the House investigation, Washington misled and lied to that investigation through his and so they were supposed to vote one in the order. And so the House was led to believe that Washington did not make a mistake. And what that allowed them to do is Washington to convince the House and the Senate to create a United States Army. That uh, was in wrong order. Now they found a competent general, Anthony Wayne, who was the bad Anthony Wayne, even though he was not insane, he was a very competent general. And he spent the next year and a half training almost 3,000 soldiers now in a professional United States Army, all because Washington wanted to take over the Ohio, but when it's one other thing. And at a battle called Fallen Timbers, three years later, they defeated the Confederacy, which had, which had begun to break up, they were bickering, some wanted to make an agreement, with the United United States. Some just want to fight each other. Anthony, Matt Anthony Wayne, Wayne, Matt Anthony Wayne would win that. There's the statue at one of the statues at Fallen Timbers. And the real thing is Washington lied through his teeth because he wanted a professional army. He wanted a large standing army, which did not happen, but got a standing army. And that's where the United States Army came from, which George Washington lied to Congress about a disaster call or disaster of St. Cloud's defeat. So, by every definition, this is one of the most dishonest actions by a president of the United States, and it was a first. Pretty cool, huh? Now, there'll be some more down the road, but he really wanted the army. Him and the Secretary of the Treasury had this vision of kind of a military state. Who was the Secretary of the Treasury? He'd be later murdered by a man, by the Vice President. Alexander Hamilton. Yes, Hamilton, yep. Oh. <laughs> Hamilton. Hamilton, really, Hamilton was big in the military and dictatorships. So, let's get to another. Speaking of corrupt presidents, let's jump right into Warren G. Hardy. I thought about doing a little bit of Grant, too. But um, Grant has been overplayed, his corruption. They, and he was not near as corrupt as his opponents would say. Harding was. Harding was, without a doubt, one of the most corrupt presidents in American history, partially because he had been elected president with no idea what he was going to do, very little knowledge of government. And so he delegated everything to friends and cronies, people who buttered him up, etc. And so this group, he's from Ohio, so they dug the Ohio game. By the way, has anyone ever seen the classic Christmas story called Christmas Story? And the high, the high school they go to is Warren G. Hardy High School. Yeah. And if you look at, you know, they have those things for graduates up on the wall. And I think in 2016, Warren G. Hardy signed that to graduate. Okay, I signed Warren G. Hardy. And it's still up there. <laughs> I have all these names of people graduated in 2016. There's Warren G. Hardy. So, just spend an hour trying to find it. Okay, so, Harry Doherty would be one of the leaders of it, and he was his attorney general. Now, the attorney general, more and more, is becoming, it was not clear what the attorney general did, but after the Civil War, the attorney general would become 
the head of what's called the Justice Department. And they were the ones to carry out the legal actions for the state, the Justice Department. The Attorney General is not the president's lawyer, and it is supposed to be separate from the executive branch, even though it's part of the executive, the executive branch. So they, they will be fair and impartial to the president. And he was taking bribes as Attorney General, as people would deliver money to him in brown paper bags, basically ignoring the big ones. There's a couple big things they were doing, but partially was oil to turn its back on giving big oil leases. And this was the era of prohibition. And so to turn your back on illegal, um, illegal uh, mucha or uh, bootlegging operations. And also he was directly involved with extortion using the power of the attorney general to basically threaten people with Justice Department action unless they paid him money. So he's taking bribes and getting money too. Kind of a lucrative business if you're also the chief law enforcement agent because he looked into what he was doing and it seemed to be perfectly fine. You can see nothing wrong. And he was also known for jury tampering. So, not only in federal cases, but also back in Ohio, of setting juries up for favorable results. And here is a quote from Harding to show how he allowed this to happen by delegating so much to authority. I like that quote for lots of reasons, but I'm just trying to figure what do you mean? I don't seem to grasp that I am president. I mean, I can hear him, I can see him saying, you know, okay, I may be not qualified to be president. I'm not up to the position. No, he can't even grasp that he's president, meaning he's taken advantage by a bunch of swindlers and crooks. Because all he wanted to do is sit in the basement of the White House, drink illegal alcohol, gamble, and have many extramarital affairs. Many, 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 many. So basically, as long as they just kind of set things up for Harding, He'll go down to the basement and do whatever. By the way, this is a time of prohibition. And he's having, yes, he's the president. So one of the more famous of many was Kerry Fulton Phillips. Now that's Harding and his wife. And there's Harding, right? No, I'm sorry, that's Harding and his wife. That's Kerry Phillips. And they have discovered recently a whole series of rather shockingly explicit love letters that needless to say, we aren't going to look at a class, but some are just kind of weird and goofy, but some are like, wow, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm too it's young for that, but. It's strange to be an extra Yeah, yeah okay. and the language they use. So a lot of it, most of it's that, just kind of weird way. And then some was like, I don't want to. Okay, <laughs> but these were discovered that he was having an affair and that she was pregnant. And so they paid her $25 and sent her to Japan. 25,000. Does it 25? Yeah, 25 bucks, hit the road. <laughs> But this wasn't the only children he had. He had many more mistresses, including, well, these are two of his mistresses, that's his kid. Man, Britain right there in the left, many different times. She was pregnant twice. One appeared to be a miscarriage, the other one was probably adopted, sent to adoption. It's without a doubt that they met in what's going to become the Oval Office. I put down the Oval Office, but they didn't call it that yet. It was the executive office. The Oval Office would come about when they redid the entire White House when Truman was president. They gutted the whole thing and rebuilt it. If you go to the White House today, the outside shell is from the original, but the inside is completely redone. Now, the inside was completely redone after it was burnt in the War of 1812. The shell survived. And um, many of these affairs would be right there in the executive office. He had at least four children total, 
There's also drunken parties in the basement. Okay, this is not the party. I just found a 1920s party. That's not the White House. But that's Harding with a tuba, with a sousaphone, yes. Can you play the sousaphone? I don't think so. And at one of these parties, a at least one, perhaps more prostitutes were there. So sex workers were there. And uh, I forgot I had to cover up too fast. We're not exactly sure what happened, but one of them, one prostitute died. Now we don't know if she fell, if she drank too much, if she was murdered, but she died in the basement of the White House. In the basement of the White House. And his buddy, Harry Doherty, helped cover it up. They snuck the bodies out somehow. It appears as though it's accidental, it appears as though she fell. That's the fact, but it doesn't matter. They covered up a death of an illegal, during the legal activity. I mean, we just go on and on. This is the president of the United States, by the way. And fortunately for Harding's reputation, at least before he died, just when another massive scandal was coming out, he had a massive heart attack and died in 1923, just before all of these scandals came out. And his wife did every, Florence, did everything she could to try to tamp this down and save his reputation. Well, for their, ki for their kids. And one thing about being married, especially back then, you were kind of like owned by the husband. So if his reputation went down, your reputation went down. Even if you did get a divorce, you would be able to go down Well, and she liked being the first lady. Okay, now let's stop right there, but let me let me ask you one thing. You may know where the term first lady came from. Uh, uh, wasn't it one of the first levels wives? Good guess, but no. Dolly, no. <laughs> Rutherford B. Hayes' wife, Lucy, was a teetotaler. So she would have functions at the White House and not serve alcohol. And so they called, they dubbed her Lemonade Lucy to mock her because they're supposed to be serving alcohol. And so as a way to say, well, she's above us. She's the first lady who won't drink with us. So it was an insult for Lemonade Lucy. And then it stuck. Now, the first first lady to really become active politically would be Eleanor Roosevelt, frankly. And then probably Rosalind Carter. Who just passed away, yeah. Did you see the video of Carter turning to the Years old. He, he is? Yeah. Yeah, I oh, yeah. I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, he just does not look good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Goodbye. Have a great day. Rob me if I work and hang by your thumb.